Chocolate sales around February 14th total over $1 billion every year. It's a very big business worldwide with some very dark secrets. Here to shed some light is Lauren Ornelas. Lauren is the founder and volunteer executive director of the Food Empowerment Project, a registered nonprofit based in the U.S. which seeks to create a just and sustainable world by recognizing the power of one's food choices. Lauren's been active in the animal rights movement for over 20 years in leadership roles with Viva USA, Viva UK, and In Defense of Animals. Lauren, in the last decade or so, reports of horrific human rights violations in the chocolate trade have hit the worldwide stage. Uh, can you give us a rundown of what the cacao industry looks like today, or cocoa as it's uh, commonly known? Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't changed that much. Um, we still have the worst forms of child labor taking place in West Africa, where you have children who are using machetes to cut cacao pods out of the trees. Um, there's a number of photographs that you can see um, where children have scars up and down their legs from these machetes that they're carrying. Um, they also, you know, these cacao pods are pretty heavy, and when they're carrying them, they, they have these heavy loads many times. They're beaten um, for not moving fast enough. Uh, and worse is that a lot of these children um, actually are slaves. You know, we still have slavery taking place in West Africa where these children, they get to these plantations in a variety of ways. Either they're sold into it or their families think that they're actually going to make some money and they go there. Or sometimes they're actually kidnapped. And, and in these fields, they're not able to escape. And if they try to, they're beaten. So this is still taking place, even though, you know, this, this issue has been around for a long time now. Not enough has been done so far to stop these abuses from taking place. And I really appreciate you taking the time out, especially this time of year, to talk about this important issue. It's, it's the best time, in my opinion, really. <laughs> um, so what, uh, what age of children are we talking? Someone as young as seven, but they, some of the ones who have actually escaped, I know that some of the there have been older children who've escaped as well in their teens. Um, so that's how we get a lot of this information. It's not something that, you know, that, that they want everybody to know about. I mean, those of us who are vegan know that, you know, when you talk about how animals are treated in factory farms and slaughterhouses, it's not something they want the public to know. And it's the same thing with this industry, where you actually have reporters who've gone missing and um, who are trying to investigate and expose what's taking place in West Africa. It's my understanding around 2000, it kind of came out that this was happening. Um, why haven't changes been made since then? It seems so egregious and so horrific. Um, what's sort of getting in the way of, of, um, of ending this? Well, I think it's kind of like it is with many industries, which is profit. Um, you know, these corporations know that not a lot of people know about this. So I, I speak on this issue and most people really don't know um, what's happening in West Africa. They don't know what's happening to these children. A lot of people today don't have a hard time even comprehending the fact that slavery still is in existence. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with this issue, um, you know, again, it's not on the package. It's, it's, it's an issue that, you know, we're not getting a lot of commercial time for. Um, the government has tried to do things. They've tried to pass, um, you know, protocol to try and, change things about, you know, where the where we purchase from, but making sure it doesn't come from places like this, but it's, nothing really has a lot of teeth. Um, there have been some, some established ways of studying the issue, but, you know, for us, it's, it's not a matter of stu studying, it's a matter of ending it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we really feel like the, the more consumers know, the more consumers can make a difference and speak out against what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I wonder if you can offer explanation of why this type of injustice, this uh, child labor and slavery, is specifically concentrated in, in West Africa. I wish I knew. I mean, I, I would like to pretend I'm an expert and I know exactly why. I mean, but overall it's poverty. We're talking about some countries nearby that are incredibly poor, like Burkina Faso and Mali. They're very, very poor areas. Um, and you have the fact that cacao is only grown in certain parts of the world, and one of the areas happens to be in West Africa. Mm -hmm. so is is it right that about 70% comes from there? 
70 to 75 percent yeah. comes from West Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the vast majority is coming from this area of the world. And, you know, when you don't have, um, you know, these are outside corporations who are going into West Africa and exploiting that country's resources in terms of the people and its land. And um, so I think that you have an area where this is, where corporations are being able to do whatever they want to do. And luckily, my understanding is that Ghana is actually trying to make a change, that Ghana is making improvements in what's happening. And so, and that is where, you know, one of the, the best cooperatives that we know of exists is in Ghana. And from all reports that we've heard from people who have been down there is that they're taking this issue seriously. And Ghana, in fact, has a law um, saying that kids need to be in school. So when they're finding these children out in these fields, that's in violation of the law in Ghana. So that's actually going to help try and, and get some of these kids a better life. Mm-hmm. Just to get a further sense of the scope, um, is this like happening on majority of farms there? Or is this just a few bad farms? Or like how many kids would you say are involved? It's estimated between Ghana and the Ivory Coast is about 1.8 million children who are victims of the worst forms of child labor. Wow. wow. Um, so that's a lot. And we know that there's a film called The Dark Side of Chocolate. And we do know from that film, when they would just go out to different areas, they would find kids all the time. So, you know, again, the worst forms of child labor includes, you know, the fact that they're carrying these heavy machetes, that they're exposed to agricultural chemicals. So it's, it seems pretty prevalent that it's taking place there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just kind of curious, is, is it just cacao? Like, is it is it also coffee and, and maybe other crops as well, or...? You know, our work has primarily been done on cacao because we know that's where the outright slavery is taking place. We do have some information on our website about some of the other issues where we do know that slavery is taking place as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of uh, the scope of it, mm-hmm. it's kind of why we focus on chocolate, I think. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, so what can, you know, we as consumers trying to trying to be ethical and make the best choices we can, uh, we probably go for vegan, we probably go for fair trade. Um, can you talk about, like, what fair trade means? Is that is that enough? Um, does that guarantee that the chocolate is slave-free? Well, there's nothing that I, you know, unless you're growing it yourself, I guess there's no way that we as consumers can know for 100% sure that anything is slave-free. That's why Food Empowerment Project, we have a list of vegan chocolates that we recommend that do not source from West Africa. Because it's so prevalent in West Africa, it seems best at this point to just avoid it altogether, other than this one cooperative in Ghana. Um, Unfortunately, fair trade, they have found children working in fair trade fields before and again to the credit of the fair trade people. The children were pulled out and put into school. But we've heard a lot of complaints uh, about um, fair trade maybe not really having as many farmers at the, at the table than they should. Mm-hmm. The fair trade is actually the market value of a product, of the cacao, not necessarily a living wage for the people. So although, you know, it's a good start, we don't feel comfortable just on the basis of a fair trade label saying, okay, you can buy from that. That It's just so prevalent in West Africa that it's best to avoid it. I've heard the um, argument that, uh, I mean, some people say because um, these f- fair trade initiatives had farms which they had to suspend because um, child labors were found there that was seen as evidence that the fair trade system is flawed as well. On the other hand, people argue um, that exactly it's a sign that the fair trade system is working, that these farms were found and the relations with them were suspended. Um, What is your take on that? I I mean, I get that completely. I understand that they're saying, oh, this is proof that it's working, that we found it and we're trying to remedy the situation. For us, the fact that they're still finding it in a fair trade field, I mean, the reason why they use children or the reason why they enslave people is because they are not getting enough money. So inherently there has to be a problem in how much money they're not getting if they're still turning to that form of getting labor. Mm-hmm. So, you know, our feeling is in some ways, absolutely, that's great. 
but our feeling more and more recently after studying and learning more about this issue is that maybe cooperatives really is going to be the best solution where you have the farmers making the decisions for themselves, for their livelihoods, for their families, for their villages, that they make the decisions. And it's not a westernized entity coming in and telling them that what they should or shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. It sounds also like um, on the on the consumer end of things that the prices would have to be probably jacked way up in order to uh, cause, like we really shouldn't be paying a dollar for a chocolate bar, whatever. For the real cost of it is like way way bigger. I know uh, locally there's a, there's a chocolate brand uh, called Zimped. It's raw chocolate, and they're on your recommended list. And, uh, yeah, their bars, it's like one bar for $5. And, it, like, you look at it and you think, oh, that's, that's way too much. But when you think about the real cost of chocolate, it, it makes sense. Things are cheap for a reason. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned... Yeah. You mentioned, Lauren, um, that you do have a list uh, on your website. Let's talk a bit about that list. There are some surprises on the list of companies that you don't recommend who either didn't respond or um, who who wouldn't disclose which country their chocolate comes from. Can you talk a bit about that? Sure. I mean, we're trying to be as transparent as possible on our list, and we give a full disclosure of everything, and we feel that people need to know where the companies they're purchasing from, where they stand as well. So our list is broken into the companies that we recommend, which means they don't source from West Africa other than Divine, which sources from a cooperative in Ghana, um, as well as all the ones we don't recommend and why. We are a vegan organization, and unfortunately a lot of the companies who won't even disclose to us and won't even respond to us are vegan companies. And we feel that, you know, vegans need to to use their voices and demand some answers. Um, One of the companies who won't disclose to us the country of origin is Cliff Bar. And um, Cliff Bar portrays themselves as a very sustainable company, and in some ways they really are, but they're not being transparent. In fact, they claim that where they source their cacao from is proprietary information. And as you can see, there we have loads of companies on our list who understand the bigger picture here and who are willing to disclose, even if they don't fall on our recommended list, but understand the importance at least of being transparent to their consumers. Mm-hmm. So you have a, a petition for, for Cliff Bar, who also makes Luna Bars, to disclose, and that's um, on your website, I guess. Um, what, what's your hopes with your petition? Uh, we are looking for thousands of signatures on our petition to Cliff Bar. It's important for them to understand that, that they can't hide on this issue, that they can't hide behind some claim of proprietary information when we're talking about something as serious as child labor. This is an important issue, and we have the right to know, and we have a right to take a stand against some of these abuses that are taking place. Um, Our website is foodispower.org. Now you can find the petition as well as under resources, our, our chocolate list as well. Good, good. So that's one thing that, that individuals can do is uh, sign that petition um, to Cliff Barr. Um, can you share your thoughts on what you think needs to happen in the big picture uh, for this to come to an end? Sure. Well, I think that, I mean, what people can do, one, is just be aware of the issue. Like, it's the easiest thing you can do is recognize that this is happening, accept that it's happening. And it's not easy to accept that this is happening today, but I can say that we still have children who enslaved for commodity like cacao. I mean, it's, it's hard to wrap our head around, especially people who are very compassionate. And so just like we do when we talk about animals who are raising folks for food or animals in entertainment or other forms of animal abuse, it's a shock to realize and accept that it's happening. Step two is always trying to figure out what you can do in your own life to not participate in that suffering and in that cruelty. And that's making sure that you don't buy chocolate that comes from West Africa. Mm-hmm. And again, we encourage you to use our list. After that is to use your voice. Use your voice to speak out against what's happening and contact these companies. Contact your favorite company who isn't on our recommended list and and ask them, where are you sourcing your cacao if they're not being transparent? And if they are being transparent but they're not on the recommended list, ask them to switch suppliers. We have heard from a number of companies who have contacted us and said, we want to switch suppliers. So we have a list ready for companies to help them make the switch. And that's what we want them to do. We we need to take a stand against what's happening there in West Africa. And and when we talk about the bigger picture, I mean, I think that when you 
when you hear companies like Nestle and Hershey say things like, we know, we know what's happening there and we're working on it. I find that to be absolutely obscene. You stop it. You cease production there until you can figure out what needs to happen. And again, they know what needs to happen. They need to pay these farmers what they deserve. They need to pay these people a living wage. And until that happens, this is going to continue. And until these corporations are held accountable, this is going to continue to happen. So if the Hershey guy needs however many houses or yachts or whatever he needs, whatever, it's going to have to cease. He's going to, these people are going to have to take some responsibility for the fact that they are responsible for what's happening. And it's only, it's only through our voices as consumers can we make sure that they hear us. I really appreciate the work of uh, Food Empowerment Project about issues like this and other other uh, food justice issues, bringing veganism to to a bigger picture, um, not only focusing on non-human animal exploitation, but human animal exploitation as well. I'm just sort of curious, I guess, personally, um, how do you feel about the label of vegan? Does does it necessarily include, you know, human suffering? And can can companies call themselves cruelty-free or vegan? Or what are your thoughts on that? I like it. I, I see that companies who call their chocolate cruelty-free, if it comes from West Africa other than a cooperative, and, you know, I think that they can't do that. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's right. And I think it gives the wrong impression mm-hmm. um, because it, it can't be cruelty-free off the, sla- off the backs of children, off of slavery. That's not cruelty-free. And so in terms of vegan, I don't really even want to touch the definition <laughs> of vegan because we have quite enough time getting people to understand that vegan is no animal products, period. Yeah. But I do believe strongly that we as vegans, because we, we came into a consciousness and understanding about suffering and wanting to do something about it, and I believe that all of us owe it to ourselves and every the planet, basically, in the world, that we live up to this. But if we say we make these choices um, because we care about ending suffering, because we care about justice, then that justice needs to expand and that compassion needs to expand to all. And I think that if, if anybody can do it, the vegans are really the ones who are in the, the best place to do it. Thank you so much, Lauren Ornelas, for joining us today again. Uh, the website is foodispower.org, and the organization is called Food Empowerment Project. Uh, thanks, Lauren. We hope to talk to you again in the future. Thank you. Thanks for all y'all do as well. Take yeah. care. Y'all do as well. Take yeah. care. Y'all do as well. Take care.